We're at Guilford College on a rainy Friday in January, and as you might expect, no environmental situation is without its challenges when it comes to photography. Typically a room like this, which is glass essentially all the way around, would pose an interesting and complex problem because of the amount of sun outside the room. Today we're dealing with a completely different scenario where the room will actually be lighter than the outside world. Ideally, we would prefer a lighting scenario where the light volume in the room equaled the light volume outside the room. So today, given the inverse of our typical problem, we're going to have to worry about how mirror-like the glass will become and what the angle of reflection will be as our strobes fire. We typically use a technique which we've modified called flambient, where in the end we'll be using masks to blend the windows in. But on a day like today, that is not necessarily going to be an easy thing to do. Anyway, we'll be setting up our equipment and we'll check back in with you as we work through this room. Doing photography on a wet and gray rainy day is always very challenging. And I guess as the shoot was finishing, I was concerned about what would have been worse, a bright sunny day with a very bright blue sky or a very cloudy, dreary day. If you're thinking that everything can be fixed in, quote, Photoshop, unquote, or post-processing as we prefer to say since we don't use Photoshop, the answer is yes and no. The old 80-20 rule is uh, unfortunately always applicable. Enough time, enough energy, anything can be fixed. But the practical matter is that since we shoot raw, we already have a significant amount of time invested in post-processing. If you're not familiar with the difference between raw and JPEG, the raw image is 100% of the data collected from the sensor. A JPEG is only 20%. So the good part of photographing RAW is that we capture all the data, all the detail, all the color. The bad news is that there's a significant amount of work associated with processing the images. DxO out of France, which is the processing software we use for RAW images, does have local corrections rather. And local corrections would have enabled us to change the color of the gray sky to blue. We decided not to do that. The second problem we faced repeatedly throughout that room was the fact that the room reflected a tremendous amount of light. Even though a window is theoretically transparent, even when a glass window is transparent, when light strikes it at a certain angle, it will become very much like a mirror. The law of physics associated with this is that light reflects at the complement of the angle with which it strikes an object. So even if the light hits or appears to hit a transparent piece of glass at 90 degrees, the way the light scatters in the room will cause a significant amount of reflection. And as you look at the images from this room, you'll notice that the center panel is accompanied by glass panes at 45 degrees. So as we worked our way through the room, we had to realize that there would be multiple reflections everywhere. We made a tactical and strategic decision that we would simply move the lights, take additional photos, and merge them later in post-processing. We could have worked until we found precisely the right location to locate our strobes, but in the end, <clears throat> that would have taken considerably more time and since we're paid by the hour, that could potentially have cost considerably more money. There's also a frustration factor. At the end of shooting a building, the average time being about eight hours, we're physically, emotionally, and intellectually tired. The more that we struggle with getting a certain shot, the more likely we are to fatigue before the job is finished. The methodology that we use, which is an adaptation of something called flambient, allows us to take multiple images, select the part that we wish, and merge them all together into a finished image. We elected to do that. 
As far as the rest of the building is concerned, there was a gourmet kitchen with a lot of stainless steel. In addition to that, when we shot from behind the counter out, we were again confronted with very complex glass. We also discovered that even though the uh, conference room building is detached and a fair distance from the windows of the gourmet kitchen, we were picking up reflections in the windows of the conference room. Once again, we were forced to rethink how we were going to light the room and how we would take multiple photos to ultimately get the one that we needed. Several of the spaces that we worked with, a conference room for example, with very dark wood paneling that had been discovered during the process of renovation, presented similar problems. You may not think about it this way, but just because the surface is dark, it doesn't mean that it's not highly reflective. Dark wood can be particularly mirror-like. So once again, we were in a situation where we had to determine what was a natural reflection from the windows in the room and what was a reflection from the strobes. Once again, we elected to go with the Flambean approach so that ultimately we could combine the images into one that looked exactly the way the eye would see it. There were other challenging rooms as well. Up on the third floor, a small sitting area with a television. Very small spaces are very difficult to light. The TV, of course, a flat panel, was very mirror-like. And even though we tried to shoot around it, we had to expose multiple versions of the photograph in order to catch one where the LCD was actually black. Now, if the flat panel were actually working and plugged in, the easy solution would have been to turn the TV on that would have caused the light reflecting from the strobe to disappear. The most difficult area ended up being downstairs in the basement, a game room, white walls, essentially painted cinder block, painted plaster, a lot of reflective furniture, a white couch, a big flat panel TV, and off in the back corner, a laundry room, we elected to spread our lights as far as we possibly could to lower their intensity and to rely much more on ambient light than we had in other portions of the building. It's also very difficult in some spaces, as it was in the basement game room, to shoot around the stanchions that support the ceiling. Finding the right angle and still capturing the emotion of the space when there are pillars in the way is not easy to do. We elected to take a couple of extreme angles that we ordinarily would not have used so that we could capture the depth and breadth of the space without letting the pillars get in the way and obscure the actual photograph. While the human eye in real life tends to avoid them or stitch the space in such a way that they don't dominate, the way that the camera sees the world allows the pillars to become far more prominent than they are to the human eye, and therefore a distraction that causes the emotional imagery to be lost. If you think it's as easy as point and shoot, it isn't. And the more complex the space is, the more difficult and taxing it is to figure out exactly how you're going to handle things. One of the critical factors is the relationship between the intensity of light outside the room and the intensity of light in the room. While theoretically, since it was a very rainy, cloudy day, it should have been fairly easy to compensate because of the gray sky. In many respects, it turned out to be much more difficult. Learning to be a professional photographer means growing from the experiences, however challenging they are. And even though this was a relatively small shoot and a relatively confined building, it turned out to be one of the more challenging ones that we'd faced in quite some time. So thanks, I hope you'll stop by again and we'll be talking about another building in the future. Have a great day.